It's been more than two months since last time we updated the news about Euclid, which was the Euclid ERO image release. Have you been wondering how is Euclid going now? So today I'm attending Euclid France meeting in Lyon. Follow my step, let's uh, find out the latest update about Euclid. During this meeting, I had the pleasure of inviting Henry John McCracken, who leads the OUVs team. His team plays a pivotal role in calibrating Euclid Viz raw images. The real the story of OUVs and VizPF and Euclid over the last couple of months is first of all, we're discovering what a sensitive instrument the Viz camera is. And because the Viz camera is so sensitive, it means that we're in a very good pro position to um, diagnose and understand everything that's happening inside the Euclid telescope. Uh, so the last few months have been very exciting for us. We saw our very first uh, Viz images in July from the commissioning. And uh, for me, it was terribly exciting, but it was a little worrying at the start because, because of course, as everyone knows, the first Viz images had some stray light inside. Uh, and so uh, our first objective working with the Viz teams is to try to understand what the characteristics are of the stray light. And as you understand, in fact, the stray light um, uh, does have a dependence on the attitude of the telescope and that if you change the attitude of the telescope you can reduce the impact of the stray light. But um, So the stray light was the first thing that we came across but at the same time I should say from the very start uh, even from the commissioning data we were able to combine Viz images and see what um, a little bit of the Viz survey would look like and we could see what the faint galaxies and how much structure and information and detail is present in the Viz images. Uh, um, and then, of course, the main focus over the last uh, few weeks has been uh, getting all the pieces together for the last ESA review, the Mission Commissioning Readiness Review, uh, where we have to demonstrate to ESA that Euclid meets uh, the requirements. Inside my hand is a small glass of a mirror. It's actually very special because it has 11 layers on top of this mirror. If you see from different angle, you see different color. It's actually the same technology we use in Euclid. So today I'm going to this lab to show the detail about how do you make such kind of glass. So this mirror makes uh, Euclid very powerful because you have a one light, then after this mirror you have a uh, both infrared towards one direction yeah. and uh, visible in uh, yes. light towards one direction. So we can do the, I mean, both infrared and the visible light, I mean, simultaneously together for, 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 the, for the survey. Yes, okay. correct. The so phase effect uh, is very tricky to handle and uh, at the end uh, we need to, to measure uh, it uh, precisely in order to, to take it into account in the uh, process and remove the contribution of the dike rig. Uh, I see. Uh, in the PSF. And uh, all this uh, bench is dedicated to, uh, to measure the, the wave front yeah. uh, this, uh, this component uh, according to the wavelength, the angle of incidence and the polarization state. So the component is here, so the light arrives on the surface and then the reflective beam is uh, 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 collected by the trombone, uh, not by the trombone, by the rear mirror, uh, the, the mirror uh, over there. And then uh, there is a beam reducer system in order to, uh, to go from the 100 mm in diameter up to a smaller beam for, in order to match the, camera, the cameras. And there, there is a, a diagnostic block here with all the uh, uh, cameras, so the camera for the wavefront sensing, so it's a Shark Hartman device system. There is a camera for the measurement of the intensity. Uh, the intensity reflected by the uh, the the like rig, and there is also a camera here uh, mounted on the transaction stage uh, in order to perform some uh, PSF uh, PDC uh, measurement. So where you made the, the small souvenir? Uh, ah the, yes, uh, small piece of glass. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, we made it with the coating machine over there, the Spectre. The coating is uh, uh, the, yeah, the coating is made of 
uh, only 11 layers 11 of layers. Uh, uh, silica, silica, silicon dioxide, mm -hmm. and uh, um, tantalum uh, pentoxide. Side. And we, uh, we stack uh, basically quarter wave layer of each material, uh, alternatively, and uh, we are able uh, to, to, to shape the reflectivity mm -hmm. uh, in order to have a, a cutoff at uh, 500, 550 uh, nanometers. And the, this cutoff uh, shift with the angle, yeah. and we can uh, uh, move the reflection bound mm -hmm. uh, towards the, the blue. So that's why we, when we, you, you uh, uh, tilt the, you the optic, color yes, yes. The uh, I also talked to Jean Philippe. He's an expert working on exoplanet research. Let's hear from him. How do we use uh, Euclid to study exoplanet? I was quite, quite surprised because you are trying to use Euclid to detect the exoplanets. Uh... So already in 2007, with the first version of the Euclid Space uh... Project, I proposed mm -hmm. to do microensing observations. Microensing. Because they, that's a way to... Microensing is a way to mm -hmm. try to detect other planets towards the galactic center. Mm -hmm. So what you do is that you monitor millions of stars over a period of few months yes. to detect small blips, so basically stars being amplified by another star passing in front of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if the lensing star is a planet, you can detect the planet. To do that efficiently, to be able to find small planets, mm -hmm. uh, you have to have a camera that has a very good resolution to be able to separate the different stars. Yes. So that's why you have to do it from space. And mm -hmm. Euclid is a perfect machine. So we're going to observe nine fields uh, in the galactic bulge okay. uh, that will be larger than what Roman will observe because Roman will basically choose its way exactly mm -hmm. uh, in it. And we need one, and we will have only one epoch in time. Now, we are not going to detect planets with this uh, single Euclid epoch, mm -hmm. but when uh, Roman will detect a planet, yeah. Uh, it will give us some very strong constraints to be able to say what is exactly the mass of the planet. Uh, so without okay. uh, without Euclid precursor observations, yes. uh, the masses of the planet will be known maybe to 40%, 50% okay. at, the, at the moment of the discovery. Mm -hmm. And then you have two possibilities. Either you wait to have several years with Roman, mm -hmm. and then you will be able to use these constraints to, to have a good mass measurement, mm -hmm. or you use precursor Euclid observations, and you have the mass measurement immediately. Okay. So you, thanks to Euclid, you can detect yes. uh, these planets and measure their mass from yeah. the first year of uh, Roman. Today I'm uh, going to the Euclid uh, Science Data Center in Lyon, actually the SDC of France, right? Yeah. So it's uh, this building. So let's go inside and uh, see how the scientists uh, process the Euclid data, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay, let's go. This is a service machine, for example, the machine that we use for Euclid, uh, yes. the SSL is a machine as this. Mm -hmm. This is a disk machine. So this is a machine used for, for the, um, for the, uh, you can see, I don't know, okay. Ah, that's uh, for the, this is the server disk. Server disk, yeah. So it's, uh, you can see you have uh, 12 disks. On each machine, and uh, so. Right. And this is a computing machine, so the machine that we use for the computing. This one. Yeah. Okay. And you can see there is uh, the processor, and so processor, yeah. Okay. In each one, and you can you have a one, two, three, four. Okay. Processor. Okay. This is a. You have uh, the core, the CPU, and so. Okay. And each machine contains two hundred fourteen the number of cores that you have. Okay. This is a main computing room. This is more efficient because we use uh, water that so we cool uh, for, the cooling. Okay. for the cooling. Oh, these are the cooling systems. Yeah, there is the cooling system, the, um, this black... Uh, oh, the pipe. So the pipe black. Okay. So we have uh, uh, 24,000 uh, uh, liter water in, on the top. We cool the water, the water uh, is uh, coming to the uh, mm, cooling system inside the rack yes. and uh, uh, the, it's, uh, the, it's uh, heated and we use the water that has been heated by the, the, uh, the cooling system inside the rack yeah. to heat uh, the part of, of, ki of oh, okay. chemical yeah. department uh, yeah. just inside. Here we have all the computing machine for the batch farm. 
So we have a slower and HD Condor machine. And uh, so you can go inside. There is a, a 16 degree difference between inside and inside. And you can. It's a hotter or cooler? It's hotel inside. It's a hotter. Uh, okay. <laughs> So you actually have a lot of empty space to improve the performance. Yeah, we have a, we also empty rack and we have another small uh, room that is empty. And it's already ready, but it's uh, still empty. Okay. okay. So this is a Ceph FS server disk. E4, E. Eight. Uh, this is the disc, uh, the, the machine that provides the disc uh, for uh, Euclid also. Okay. So the CFFS uh, PC inside and uh, it's outside. Uh. Okay, so if you want to hear more updates about Euclid, don't forget to subscribe our channel. Hope to see you guys soon.